Hi everyone, my name is Sally Waring. I am a biologist. I study microorganisms like algae and little flagellates. Today we're going to be watching a couple of episodes of a series that I made with AMNH last year. It's called Pond Life. It's about microbes. So thanks so much for joining. If you've got any questions, you can post them in the chat box and I'll answer any questions that you have about the, the episodes or about microbes. And yeah, please enjoy. Thanks for joining. My name is Sally. I am a biologist at the American Museum of Natural History where I study microscopic organisms. Upon life, we are going to go on a safari to explore the microbial wildernesses that exist all around us. I'm in the middle of Manhattan. I'm at the Harlem Mayor in Central okay. Park. And I'm here great. to look for a particular microbial community. Oh. It's a community that you might have seen before, but you've probably not looked at it quite like this. For most of human history, people thought of all life as being plants and animals. And the fact that species existed that were so small that you couldn't even see them was completely unknown. That all changed in the 17th century when a Dutch fabric designer named Antony van Leeuwenhoek invented the most powerful microscope the world had ever seen. I have a replica of his microscope in my pocket. This is it. This tiny little thing contains a really small spherical glass lens and that spherical glass lens was capable of magnifying up to 300 times. So he would place whatever he was interested in on one side of the lens. He would look through by placing the microscope right up to his eye. So using this microscope, he became the first person to see unicellular life. And he first saw that unicellular life when he looked at a community of microorganisms called pond scum. And I can see a beautiful example right over here. Pond scum is a growth of filamentous green algae. And I've put some here on my Leeuwenhoek microscope. And we're gonna take a look and see what he might have seen in the pond for the first time. Leeuwenhoek learned by looking through his microscope that the pond scum was made up of green algae that wound together. But what amazed him the most was that moving amongst that green algae were tiny little creatures. He called those little creatures animalcules, or little animals. These days, microscopy and our understanding of microbiology have come a long way. I have with me a modern day field microscope. Rather than a small spherical lens, it has an objective. An objective contains many glass lenses stacked one on top of each other. I'm gonna take a look at what we've got. At 100 times magnification, we can really see the details of this green alga. It's called Spirogyra. Each Spirogyra filament is one cell thick, about the width of a human hair. Spirogyra gets its name because inside each cell there is a long, thin, green chloroplast that coils and gives the organism its corkscrew appearance. Spirogyra, like all algae, live off sunlight. 
But when they grow in dense mats like the one in the Harlem Mere, the filaments on top end up shading the ones beneath. But Spirogyra has a way of dealing with this. The filaments are able to glide and they stay constantly on the move. This way each filament will, at least for part of the time, have access to the sun. Just like Leeuwenhoek, we find many microbial creatures living among the algae. Here there are several species of ciliate. Ciliates are a diverse group of single cellular organisms that are covered in small hair-like structures called cilia. Each species of ciliate has a unique arrangement of cilia. This one has cilia only on the underside of its cell. It uses the cilia like tiny legs to walk about on the spirogyra. This is one of the ciliates that Leeuwenhoek was first to describe. It's called Vorticella. Each is an individual bell-shaped cell sitting atop a long stalk. That stalk is rather special. It's a curious coiling contraption that can move like lightning, if the cell senses any danger. The stalk also keeps the vorticella anchored, so that it can use its cilia to generate a current in the water. The cilia are arranged in a ring around an opening in the cell that acts as a mouth. The cilia beat and drag water, bacteria and other small microbes right into the vorticella's waiting mouth. This beautiful organism is a heliozoan. Helio meaning sun and zoan meaning animal, though it's not an animal at all. The heliozoan is covered in many spike-like structures called exopodia, which radiate out from the cell's surface and act as a net for ensnaring prey. In real time, the heliozoan appears static, but under time-lapse it really comes to life. A green cell is ensnared. makes a lucky escape. The second cell is not so lucky. Leeuwenhoek was fascinated by organisms that moved like animals but were green like plants. This one is called Phacus. It's not an animal or a plant. It belongs to a completely separate group of organisms called the Eugelina. Its movement is due to a long, thin structure called a flagellum that extends out the front of the cell. The flagellum beats and pulls the cell through the water. You can also catch a glimpse of a red spot inside the phagus. This is called an eye spot. It sits at the base of the flagellum and can detect the intensity and direction of light. Like a plant, the phagus lives off sunlight, and this eye spot allows it to move through the water to wherever the light intensity is best. In that one drop of water, we just saw a wide variety of microbial species. In the whole pond, their numbers probably reach into the many thousands. And that's only scratching the surface of the amount of microbial diversity that we can find the world over. And to really get a handle on this microbial diversity, we're just going to have to keep exploring. Put these microbes back where I got them from. Thanks everyone for watching. We've had some good questions come through the chat while the episode was going on. So Theo asks, is there anything smaller than a micro? And the short answer is yes, there's, there are lots of things smaller than a microbe. Microbes themselves come in all different sizes. So you can get some that are actually quite large. Some microbes are, are large enough to see without a microscope. And then you get micro microbes that are so small that it's hard to see them with a light microscope. You need an electron microscope, which is more powerful. But then microbes are made of cells. And then and there's all these things inside cells. There are organelles, there's DNA, there's proteins, and they're all smaller than the microbe cell that they're inside. 
And then those that DNA and proteins are made out of atoms and atoms made out of electrons, neutrons, and so on and so on. So things just keep getting smaller, way smaller than microbes. All right, we've got another question. Where did you get that tiny microscope and how well does it work? That tiny microscope is a replica of an old Leeuwenhoek microscope. But the replica, the one that I'm using is actually quite old itself. It was built in the 1930s by a company called Bausch & Lohm. They were a company that used to make a lot of lenses and microscopes and cameras and things like that. Uh, they did a run sometime in the 30s making the beautiful replica microscopes of Leeuwenhoek's microscope. And that's what I'm using in the film. And yeah, it works pretty well. So it's a single lens microscope. It's, it doesn't work as well as some of our modern microscopes, but you can see a lot of things and it's actually pretty good quality and you can get other single lens microscopes today uh, that you can use at home and they also work pretty well. Okay, another question. What are animalcules and <clears throat> are they microorganisms too? Yes, so animalcules is, just means little animals. And the reason that microbes were called animalcules to begin with is because back in the 17th century, uh, people used to divide all life into plants and animals. And if something moved, it was considered an animal. So when Leeuwenhoek looked through the microscope and he saw these little things moving around, he thought, hey, these are tiny, tiny little, little animals. And so he gave them the name little animals, which is animalcules. Okay, so now that we're done with the first episode, we thought it might be fun just to show you some live footage, not live footage, but footage from the microscope, direct from the microscope of me looking at some microbes. So what's gonna happen now is that we're gonna roll some footage that I took on the microscope of some microbes. Most of these microbes are really common species that you find in New York City or wherever you happen to be. And I'm gonna describe what's happening, what's going on on the screen. And if you have questions, just post them in the chat and I'll answer any questions that come through. All right. Okay. Hi everyone. <laughs> We're having some technical difficulties, I believe, but uh, soon we will have this microbial footage up and we will discuss it. I'm sitting here in my garden. I'm currently in the UK, uh, in a little village near Cambridge. But here we go. Oh, no, not footage this time. So anyway, it's a beautiful evening in my garden. It's probably full of microbes here too. Uh, I can see what's happening. Okay, we've got a couple of questions come through. Uh, someone asked, what are the microbes we're looking at right now? Right now, we're actually looking at a species of green alga. Uh, it's a little colonial green alga. So each colony 
is uh, made up of four cells and those cells, each cell has a little flagellum on it, it actually has two flagella and they, and they use those flagella to move around. We've changed now. We've changed now to a cyanobacteria, cyanobacterial colony. So these are really common uh, bacteria that live in fresh water and in salt water and they're photosynthetic bacteria, which means they eat by harvesting, well, they don't actually eat, they harvest energy from sunlight. This next one is an organism called a euglena and it's actually also an algae. It's actually a green cell. You can see that green tint to the cell there, but it lives inside this, this casing called a, a lorica. It's a, it's a shell and that protects the delicate cell from the external environment. And if you look closely, you can see a little green, oh, I'm sorry, a red spot on that, within that green cell. That's actually something called an eye spot. And eye spots are little organelles that sit within the cell and they can sense the direction and the intensity of light. So they function like a really primitive eye, right? And they allow this, this microbe to sense where the light's coming from and if it's too strong or too weak. And so it can move around to either go, get into the sun or move out of the sun where it needs to. Because this is also a photosynthetic organism and it lives off sunlight. And we've got a question about what microbes eat. So not all microbes eat, Microbes like these algae don't need to eat. They can get all the energy they need from, from sunlight and from some nutrients in their environment. But lots of microbes do need to eat. And they eat uh, by, by, lots of them use a process called phagocytosis where they, where they uh, latch onto another cell and they, and they ingest some of that cell into their own cell. So far in this footage, we've just seen photosynthetic microbes. So all the ones you can see here are photosynthetic, so they, they live off sunlight. This coil that we're looking at is a, is a cyanobacterium. It's a colony of cyanobacteria called Dolicospermum, and it forms these beautiful coils. And those lighter cells that you can see are actually specialized cells in the colony, and they function by fixing nitrogen. So nitrogen is actually, it can be quite hard for living organisms to absorb uh, usable nitrogen from their environments. But those lighter colored cells are specially designed uh, to do this, to absorb nitrogen. So they absorb the nitrogen, they, they turn it into a product that all the cells in the colony can use, and they share that nitrogen with all the other cells in the colony. So this colony really works together and has division of labor with, where some cells are fo focused on photosynthesizing and others are fo focused on uh, nitrogen uh, nitrogen absorption. And around that colony, you can see all these other tiny little cells. So those are non-photosynthetic cells, the, the tiny little clear ones, if you can see them. They're little uh, called heterotrophic cells. So those are things that need to eat. And what they'll be doing is looking around this cyanobacterial colony for anything that's small enough to eat. Because often uh, one microbe will attract other microbes, right? So the cyanobacterial colony might be covered in other small bacteria and those flagellates might be looking around for a bacterium to, to phagocytose. Oh yeah, these are really beautiful organisms. These are a type of organism called a dinoflagellate. And these are actually very common as well. They, you find them in freshwater. These ones I found in Central Park. And they're beautiful cells and each cell is covered in these hard armored plates. Right, and that's what gives the, each cell this kind of really structural spaceship-like form, right? So the soft cell body sits inside this, this hard armor-like structure and they, they grow in these beautiful different forms. Some uh, have long pointy bits like these ones, others look kind of like the Death Star. Yeah, they're really beautiful. And you can see coming out the back of these cells is something called a flagellum, right? That's that kind of long tail whip-like thing. And that is what allows these cells to move around. So just before when we could see them kind of gliding through the, through the uh, water, they were um, moving around using those, those flagella. All right, so this cell is another heterotrophic cell. So that means it's a cell that likes to eat. And it is, uh, it is a ciliate and it's, it's eating something called, it's eating cyanobacteria. So all of those filaments there are cyanobacteria, right? So they're another microbe. And this ciliate is, likes to eat cyanobacteria. And actually the ciliate right now is full of cyanobacteria. So the ciliate itself is colorless. It doesn't have any color to it, but you can see that it's quite brown inside, right? That's because it's filled with these cyanobacterial filaments that it's gobbled up from its environment. 
and it's going to search around. And look for more to eat. All right, somebody asked why some microbes move and others don't. That's a great question. So microbes have lots of different ways that they can move. Uh, some of them move by using those things called flagella, which we saw on the dinoflagellates, these, these whip-like tail structures that they can, they can uh, beat around like a kind of like a little motor right or a little paddle to, to push them or pull them through the water. Others, like actually the one we're looking at right now, which is a tardigrade, it actually is a tiny little animal and it has tiny little legs so it can walk around with its tiny little legs. Other microbes like amoeba, uh, they, they move by kind of oozing across the surface, right? But it's true that not all microbes have some of the structures that are required to move, right? So not all microbes have flagella, not all are capable of kind of amoeboid kind of oozing movement, not all have little legs. So there are lots that they that don't move around. Um, they tend to grow on surfaces or, or they can just kind of float free in the water column. And because microbes are so small and light, often they can you know, be suspended and move around in the water column quite, quite easily. So what you're watching here is a tardigrade doing some great moving around using its little legs. All right, 
Well, thank you for joining me for that. And now we're going to go to episode two of Pond Life. So this episode is all about cyanobacteria. We saw some cyanobacteria during some of the microbial footage we just looked at. And this episode is going to go into a little bit more detail about what those organisms are and, and how you can find them in the environment. Don't forget to post questions. We are surrounded by hidden microscopic worlds filled with fascinating life forms. Thousands of microbial organisms live within a single drop of water. On Pond Life, we're going on a safari to explore the microbial wildernesses that exist all around us. Today, I'm out looking for a group of organisms that evolved over two billion years ago. These organisms were the first to live by photosynthesis. That's the process of using sunlight to make sugars, and then those sugars are used to power the cell. A byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen, and two billion years ago, these organisms became so abundant that they completely changed the Earth's atmosphere. It went from one that was very oxygen poor to the oxygen rich atmosphere that we live in today. These microbes are called cyanobacteria, and lucky for me, they're just as abundant today as they were two billion years ago. In fact, I haven't had to go very far at all to find them. I've simply walked out the door, I've crossed the road, and I can already see a pond that is teeming with cyanobacteria. You can find cyanobacteria all over the world. There are currently around 3,000 described species with different morphologies and habitats, from freshwater ponds to arctic oceans. They even live in soil. As I wander around Central Park, I'm on the lookout for signs of cyanobacteria. It's cyanobacteria that are making this pond so green. If you look closely at this water sample, you can see that it's full of tiny floating green particles. Each one of those particles is a colony of cyanobacteria, and each one of those colonies is made up of multiple individual cyanobacterial cells living together. To find out what species of cyanobacteria is living here, I'm going to have to put it under the microscope. The cyanobacterium blooming in the lake belongs to the genus Microcystis. Microcystis colonies are made up of many individual cells suspended in a clear mucus. A colony may start as one cell, which divides to become two cells, then four, and so on, until some colonies are large enough to see with the naked eye. Colonies grow fast in warm summer waters, and when their numbers get dense enough, we call this a bloom. Many cyanobacterial species are bloom forming, and you can distinguish each species by their unique colony shapes. One advantage of living as a colony is that when many individuals live together, tasks can be divided among the members. We can see this in another cyanobacterium from the lake. This one belongs to the genus Dolichospermum, and among its helical colony, some cells look a little different from the rest. These specialized cells are called heterocysts, and they have given up their photosynthetic ability to focus on the task of absorbing nitrogen. They build that nitrogen into molecules that can be shared and used by all the cells in the colony, and in return, the other cells share the sugars gained through photosynthesis with the heterocyst. By dividing up these tasks, each is run more efficiently and the colony can prosper. Thousands of visitors walk through Central Park every day, mostly unaware of the many tiny dramas playing out all around them. 
with a microscope, we can catch a glimpse into these unseen worlds. The bloom in the next pond is dominated by a cyanobacterium from the genus Aphanazomenon. Aphanazomenon forms long, thin, filamentous colonies, and while at first they appear to only drift, under time lapse we can see just how busy they are. There is a good reason to stay on the move. Cyanobacteria sit at the base of the food chain and are good eating for a number of small predators. The ciliate is a specialist cyanobacteria predator. It's from the genus Nassila, and it's using its sensitive cilia to feel out a filament, searching for an end. Once located, it begins its work, sucking in the cyanobacteria like a strand of spaghetti. As the cyanobacteria get ingested, the filament bends and breaks, allowing it to fit inside the rotund little ciliate. This process can take a little time, especially if the filament is particularly long. The ciliate keeps going, and going, and going, and going, and going, until the cyanobacteria are completely swallowed up. Delicious. When I'm out looking at these microbial communities, I often see things that I want to take a closer look at. And there's only so much I can do out in the field with my portable microscope. So when I see something interesting, I take a sample, and that comes with me back to the museum and into the lab. While I'm working with the pond water, I want to keep everything sterile. This is because I don't want microbes that might be growing in the lab or on me to end up growing in my lab cultures. Now that the microbes are out of the pond and in the lab, I also need to make sure they have everything they need to survive. The bottles here contain different types of growth media. Each medium contains vitamins, minerals and salts that the microbes need. This big thing is a biosafety cabinet, and it's going to help me keep everything sterile. I wiped everything down with ethanol before it went into the cabinet, but it also has this wall of air that passes from this vent at the bottom right up the front, and that prevents any microbial spores that might be in the air from traveling through into this cabinet. At the same time, the cabinet is constantly sucking air up through a vent in the top, and that means that if any microbial spores do make it through into the cabinet, they get sucked up into that vent rather than landing on my cultures. I add a small amount of pond water to liquid medium, or spread some out onto an agar plate. That agar plate contains growth medium too, but it's been solidified by the addition of agar, a kind of jelly-like substance that's produced by certain seaweeds. Some microbes prefer to grow on the solid surface of the agar, while others grow better suspended in the liquid medium. I keep those cultures in a growth chamber. The growth chamber maintains the temperature and provides a constant amount of light each day. Cyanobacterial blooms can cause real problems. Some produce toxins that are lethal to many animals. I'm interested in the microbes that thrive here. Organisms like these flagellates, and this euglena algae, or this colodictian, all living among the bloom. Over the next few weeks, some of these microbes will grow in numbers until eventually I can isolate and identify individual species from these liquid cultures and from the agar plate.
I'm hoping that by growing and studying some of these microbes that are present in the cyanobacterial blooms, that we'll learn more about the blooms as communities, and that we can understand some of the things that are causing these extremely common phenomena. Our biggest cities contain microbial ecosystems that are vibrant and complex. Growing these right, organisms thanks, in the lab helps me to questions. understand just what Elena thrives asks, in this microscopic How do microbes reproduce? Now this is a question without a short answer. So microbes reproduce in lots of different ways. Often they reproduce vegetatively. That means that one cell just divides and becomes two cells. Uh, so this is, uh, this is asexual reproduction. A lot of microbes reproduce in this way. But also microbes are able to have sex, right? And so sometimes in the process of division, rather than dividing and producing two vegetative cells, they can go through a different process and produce gametes, right? And then those gametes go off, find other gametes, fuse, and, and form new generations, right? So microbes can have sex and they can reproduce, reproduce vegetatively as well. Okay, another question. Roxy asks, are there microbes on skin and how small are they? Yes, there are lots of microbes on skin, but they're pretty different from the ones that we've been looking at today, right? The microbes that we've been showing you today are things that live in ponds and lakes and in soil and in water. Your skin is covered in microbes, but they're, they're quite a bit smaller than, than a lot of the ones we've been looking at, and they tend to be bacteria, right? So, and bacteria uh, don't often don't have as complex structures as what we're looking at on the video. They, they tend to be simpler in, in their cell structure, but they're there. And you can see them if you have a microscope. All right, so that is the end of the live stream. Thank you so much for joining us. If you want to watch this again or share it with any of your friends or someone else, uh, the, the video will be here at this link. And thanks, everyone. Have a good day.